Good morning. My name is Jane Barrett and I'm Secretary General of the International Federation on Aging. Today, on the 1st of October, we come together to celebrate the 29th year of the International Day of Older Person, and IFA is so pleased to be able to host the webinar WHO New Tools on the Integrated Care for Older People. At a time when leadership is so critical in policy development in the field of ageing, the IFA is honoured to introduce Dr Islani Di Carvello, who through her relentless drive is responsible for the WHO guidelines for the integrated care of older people. Let me just spend a couple of minutes talking with you about Islani. She's worked for more than 15 years with the UN system at national, regional and global levels on community health, health promotion and primary health care. She's worked in Latin America, Africa, Asia, in a variety of capacities. In Brazil, she's coordinated a state reproductive health program before becoming the national coordinator of the Brazilian maternal health program. In Tanzania and Zimbabwe, she was the national health coordinator in charge of setting up health service delivery systems for primary health care with an emphasis on prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. She joined the former Department of Aging and Life Force in 2013 and led WHO's efforts to align health systems to the needs of older people with a focus on older person centred and integrated care. But for host but perhaps most importantly, Islani is that kind of professional who's a friend to all those that are committed to the lives of older people. And it is a great pleasure today that we host this webinar and I hand the floor over to Islani, who will present um, on ICO. And after that, we'd be delighted to have some questions using the Q&A. So Islani, please take the floor and thank you very much for um, presenting at this webinar. Thank you so much, Jane, for this introduction. It's really an honor to be here in this very important day in which we are celebrating older people. So this is the International Day of Older People. And I have the honor to share the WHO new tools on the integrated care for older people who has actually launched today in this WHO IFA webinar. So thank you so much, Jane, for this opportunity. In my presentation, uh, you will be actually one of the first ones who can see into detail uh, what this tool is about, why they were created, and what are the main important features of the WHO tools on integrated care. So starting by saying, by showing to you why WHO now is focused on integrated care. Universal health coverage is the way to achieve the sustainable development goal number three that focuses on health and well-being. Without considering the health and social care needs of ever increasing numbers of older people, the SCDG3 will be impossible to achieve. Therefore, two, three important commitments uh, the World Health Organization have done in order to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal 3. First was to prioritize work to drive public health impacts in every country. So every work we do as WHO should be focused on the impact in countries. Secondly, we should depart from a disease-specific approach to a more integrated and health systems-oriented approach in order to have a sustainable outcome. And lastly, WHO set ambitious target to reduce care dependence in older age, in older people by 2030. So the first questions member states came to ask us was, what is care dependence in older age? And what exactly can we do as government to reduce care dependence in older age? In 2015, WHO launched the first ever World Rep and Health Report on Aging, which defined, defined health aging as the process of developing and maintaining the functional ability that enables well-being in older age. Functional ability is defined as the combination 
and interactions of intrinsic capacity that actually is the physical and mental capacity with the environment in which a person inhabits. So you see here, we are talking about one big shift, shift from focus on disease to focusing on functioning. And actually considering capacities of other people and understanding that uh, the role that the environment plays, the important role on maintaining the intrinsic capacity and uh, the functionality of older people. So what are, old, what are the people wants? What they, they have reason to value? First is to be able to meet their basic needs. Secondly, learn, grow, and make decisions. Be mobile, to be able to move around and do the things that are important for them. You them maintain relationships and contribute. In order to be able to do all the things, there is one critical thing that we need, and this is our health. Our health in the health aging um, model of WHO is our intrinsic capacity. Intrinsic capacity and functional ability doesn't remain the same. It declines with increasing age. There is a moment in which we have high stable capacity. And then at the point in time, our capacity starts to decline. One of the signs of declining intrinsic capacity is for example, uh, when we develop limited mobility or when we lose vitality that can be represented or manifested like undernutrition or malnutrition, or when actually develop a cognitive decline. Although we may have declining capacity, we can still be independent. However, if this declines progress and become more severe, we can reach a point in which we need help of a third person with activities of daily living. This is the third phase, the third period in which we have significant loss in capacity. Many of the characteristics that determine intrinsic capacity can be modified. These include health-related behavior and the presence of disease. So there is a strong rationale for introducing effective interventions to optimize intrinsic capacity. Therefore, the ICOP approach focus target uh, all the people who has declined intrinsic capacity and the objective is to deliver intervention at primary health care or in communities who can stop or slow the progression of this decline and in this way prevent care dependence. ICOP tools will assist healthcare professional and people who support older persons in communities to detect declines in physical and mental capacities and to deliver comprehensive and integrated care to prevent and delay progression. ICOP interventions focus on six priority conditions. First is depressive symptoms. So there are interventions to manage depressive symptoms like cognitive behavior therapies, but most importantly is to address loneliness and social isolation in other people. Limited mobility, we have multimodal exercise with strength and resistance is one example of interventions in my book that can be given at home, for example, with even the help of a caregiver or community-based volunteer. Any interventions to improve mobility should be given together with uh, uh, nutritional uh, supplementations, interventions to improve nutrition. It's very common as we age, we decrease our capacity to absorb uh, pre uh, proteins and our uh, catabolism increase and our anabolism decrease. So malnutrition is a uh, very important uh, people uh, all the people that they are at risk of malnutrition and also visual impairment, hearing loss and cognitive decline. It's important to see that those 
conditions, they are interconnected. For example, when you have depressive symptoms, this is a strong risk factor for you to develop a cognitive decline. Usually, a cognitive decline is associated with limited mobility. And also, malnutrition is associated with limited mobility. Hearing loss is strongly associated with cognitive decline. So it doesn't make any sense to give interventions in isolation. Since those interventions, they have synergistic effects among them, and they should be given in an integrated care package. Unfortunately, health systems that they are not prepared to respond to the health and long-term care needs, social care needs of all the people. When people try, when the people try uh, to look after services, they are frequently faced with fragmented services, such they are too far from where they live, ageist attitudes of healthcare workers, and lack of interventions to optimize intense capacity and functionality. It's very common when an older person goes to the healthcare uh, clinic, they say, well, they don't come with a symptom that could be framed as a disease. They could come with complaints like, I'm feeling tired or I'm not sleeping well and I forget it. And usually the response they get from the health workers uh, you know what, this is normal, it's because you are becoming old. And that's a pity because these are symptoms of decline in intrinsic capacity. It's an opportunity to act to delay the progression of intrinsic capacity into care dependence is missed. So there is a strong need for us to actually to combat ageism in healthcare provision, but also to build the capacity of health professionals every health professional in the health system to be able to identify the class intrinsic capacity and deliver interventions to optimize intrinsic capacity and functional ability at community level. Integrate care for older people supports a transformation in the way health and social care systems are designed and operate. And how is that? by providing care at the communities close to where people live, by enabling health professionals, community health workers, family doctors, social workers, to work towards a single goal that's to maintain intrinsic capacity and functional ability, by engaging communities and supporting family caregivers. Community-based integrated health and social care ensures universal health coverage that's inclusive of older people, leaving no one behind. Therefore, the WHO ICOP approach reflects a community-based approach that will help to reorient health and social services towards a more person-centered and coordinated model of care that supports optimizing functionality for older people. Today, we are launching a package of tools to support country implementation, which includes a handbook that offers guidance for health and social care workers on person-centered assessments and pathways in primary care, actually how to screen all the people for the client's intrinsic capacity and how to develop a person-centered care plan. An implementation framework that will guide services and systems managers on how to assess their capacity to implement ICOP and design an implementation plan for your district, which kind of essential medicines they need to buy, what are the competencies the health professionals should have, which kind of data they should be collected. In the app that actually will help uh, uh, um, I will explain now how this app works as an example. As I mentioned before, uh, uh, the handbook for health professionals will help health professionals to implement interventions to improve musculoskeletal function, mobility, and vitality in older people, maintain all adults capacity to hear and, and see, prevent cognitive impairment and promote psychological well-being, 
manage age-related conditions such as urinary incontinence, and prevent falls, and support caregivers. Let's look now how is the implementation of, of ICO in a community? What they have professionals need to do? The first step, have professional could be a, a community health worker and could be also a nurse. In many countries, we have what's so-called uh, family health group, that's a doctor, nurse, and social worker. They do home visits and um, to check the health of the household. In many occasions, these health professionals, they, they may encounter in the household a pregnant woman, they may encounter a child, so they check if the child is under, uh, or is undernourished. Uh, but if there is another person, they don't know what to do. So actually, I could offer a screening tool in which this health professional, in the moment they are visiting this household, they can screen other people to see whether these people can have a decline in the losses and in its capacity. I will show later the screen too. It's very easy. It takes six minutes to be, to be applied. If the person doesn't have any loss in its capacity, we should reinforce generic health and lifestyle advice, also okay. It's important to check whether the other person has visited the healthcare facility in the last year. Because if not, they should be, even if the test was uh, negative, they should be advised to go to the primary healthcare facility. Everyone after 60 years old should visit at least once a year the primary healthcare facility. Usually the screening test, if it's negative, they are repeated after one year. Unless the other person has 17 five years old or more. In this case, the screening test should be repeated after six months. The ones who tested positive should be referred to a primary health care facility to undertake a person-centered assessment of the health and social care needs. And this is the transformative approach because I'm not saying a clinical assessment I'm saying a person-centered assessment. In the person-centered assessment, start with understanding who are the person in front of you. Understand the other person's life, values, priorities, in which social context this person lives. The second step of the person-centered assessment actually is to uh, ingrate that depth assess the conditions associated with loss in trans capacity. The conditions I mentioned before, actually, they're in the handbook as well as in the app. You have step-by-step -step guidance on how to undertake a test to diagnose cognitive decline and dementia, to diagnose a mobility limitation or priority, to diagnose uh, malnutrition in other people, also uh, depression and depressive symptoms, and also assess vision and hearing. After assessing uh, function, if there is a decline in this capacity, we have to understand what is causing this, this decline. Is there an underlying disease associated with the decline in this capacity? So the care plan that actually is the step three we have the personalized care plan. We will have not only community level interventions to manage the declines in the capacity, what we call the functional interventions like multimodal exercise, cognitive stimulation, cognitive training, or nutrition supplementation, but we have, we have pharmacological interventions to treat the disease who have caused these declines in this capacity. And also, in more complex case, we may um, advise to rehabilitation, sometimes palliative or end-of-life care. One important aspect is we need to assess and manage the social and physical environments. And this has to do 
with, uh, with environmental adaptations that are necessary, as well as uh, what changes in the social and physical environment are necessary so we can optimize the functionality in all of it. It's very important that to develop a personalized care plan, we start with the person-centered goal setting. And what does it mean? The goal of everything we are doing is not actually treat the disease. It actually is to help other people to achieve what's important for them, what they have reason to value. For example, maybe someone uh, has uh, developed a loss of balance, mobility limitations because of osteoarthritis pain in the knee. When we think about a person-centered goal, it's not about treating the osteoarthritis or giving medication for the pain in the knee. Maybe for what, what matter for this person is that in three months, they, they, he will be able to walk her daughter in the wedding day in the church. And he now doesn't feel confident to do that because he's losing balance or he's feeling pain in the knee. So this will be the goal of the integrated care plan. In three months, um, you will be able to walk without fear, confident, to walk your daughter through the, through, through in, the uh, in the wedding day, walk with your daughter in the wedding day uh, celebration. And the, it's important that when giving interventions and when implementing a personalized care plan, we have to ensure referral pathway and a monitoring of the care plan, which links to specialized geriatric care. And the last thing is, since most of the interventions are given at home, uh, we will need to mobilize community-based resource and also thinking about support to caregivers. There are many uh, important resources in the community that can be mobilized to support other people and caregivers. If they also those resources, they are supported by formal health services and social care services. And I can give you some example. Um, associate, associations of other people, non-governmental organization, community-based non-governmental organization, and in also international organizations. So anything we do for other person has to have the engagement of the other person themselves and the caregiver, as well as the community in which they live. I will give you now in more detail three examples of care pathways that's included in the handbook. Let's look at the care pathway to manage cognitive decline. So you have an idea how to screen and how to assess someone with cognitive decline and which kind of interventions you can give in the, the context of a community-based integrated care. First, you will screen other people for a cognitive decline. That can be at home, can be uh, with the use of a mobile phone. And this is a very simple question. Do you have problems with memory, orientation, such as not knowing where one is or what day it is? Those who are screened positive, they are, this is another option for screening as well. It's a simple memory in the orientation test, uh, very known by geriatricians, where you ask it to the other person, to, to, you, you tell them three words and ask them to keep these three words, to remember these three words. You make questions about orientation time and space. And then at the end, you ask again, what was the three words you said before? This is a high validated test and very well known in geriatric, in the size screening test. You, you can choose which test you use based on the literacy of the population which you are using, I hope you are implementing or targeting. That would, uh, the ones who pass the cognitive screening, you uh, go to the pathway, uh, we call it lifestyle advice or user care. But if the screening was positive, you need to confirm whether this person has 
a, a declining cognition, some people call it cognitive impairment, and there are many tests available that has been uh, highly validated to do it and can be used in primary healthcare setting by non-specialized health professionals. And these are some examples like the MINICOG, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, the Mini Mental State Examination, and the General Practitioner Assessment of Cognition. Uh, those tests, uh, you, one of these tests that the General Practitioner Assessment of Cognition, you can find in the app. The app will teach you how to apply this test. And it's a very simple test. You can apply it in five minutes. If you pass in this in a, if you pass a cognitive test, it means you don't have a cognitive impairment. If you fail, you have to understand what is causing this cognitive decline. Is an age-associated cognitive decline, or is a cognitive decline caused by malnutrition, or could be delirium, polypharmacy, cerebral cerebrovascular disease. So this is a condition that they can cause cognitive decline. And once they are treated, you will have normal cognition. Usually, a way to prevent cognitive decline and actually foster cognitive capacity in other people is actually give a combination of multimodal exercise with strength and resistance and also cognitive stimulation. And of course, you have to associate um, nutritional uh, supplementation or a supplemental nutrition. These are the three most important uh, exercises. If one has a cognitive decline and doesn't have dementia, by doing these three things, you will stop or delay the progression from the cognitive decline to uh, full dementia. <clears throat> Also, you have to assess and manage uh, social and physical environment. If someone has a cognitive decline that we should point that uh, it impacts in their functional ability, impact in their ability to self-care, this is actually the definition for dementia, when cognitive decline is so severe that you cannot self-care. Specifically, in this individual, you have to see uh, assess and manage the need for social care and support. Maybe you have to provide personal care and support with activity of daily living. Give a device to maintain independent toilet skills. Assess for caregiver burden or strain. We have a specific pathway in the handbook in the app to know which interventions we can give to, to assess a caregiver burden and release the strain of caregiver. And we need to develop so social care and support plan that should be always include support for caregivers on someone who has uh, progressed into dementia. Now we still have time to have a look in the care pathway to improve mobility. That also is a very important uh, care pathway. Since most of the uh, older people who need social care and support, they need because they have develop mobility limitations, severe mobility limitations that actually prevent them to be able to be independent, uh, to move around. The screen test used on, to screen for mobility limitation at home in the community is the ShareWise test. It's a simple test in which you ask for someone to sit and stand five times during 14 seconds uh, not actually holding the chair. And the app explains step by step as well as the handbook on how to use this test. This, any community health worker can learn also how to do the test and also a caregiver. If a person is able <coughs> to complete the five share rights without using arms in 40 seconds, she has passed or he the test. But if not, the person should be referred, referred to a primary health care facility to actually to make a more complete confirmation test. And the test that is used is the short physical performance battery that includes balance test, gait speed test, and the shave rise test. By applying this test, you will have three categories 
two categories of individuals. One who has no mobility, detectively, you still recommend multimodal exercise at home and support for self-management to increase adherence. The multimodal exercise can be done at home or can be done in a daycare center or in a group, that's even better. Uh, we there is a very good uh, apps also to teach how to do multimodal exercise at home. One example of it is Vivi Frail. Vivi Frail app is linked to the WHO ICOP app. But if someone has a low score, a score who indicates a limited mobility, uh, we still uh, advise uh, the use of a multimodal exercise with close supervision. And because maybe these people, they cannot do uh, exercise, they cannot do exercise at home. They, they, they need to do maybe in a rehabilitation clinic or with a supervision from a specialized professional. This, the, also the exercise should be associated and we should consider increasing protein intake because other people, as I said, they, they have increased the absorption to proteins and the catabolism of muscle mass. That's why they develop sarcopenia. And consider the provision of assistive device to aid mobility in more, more serious cases. Uh, it's important to see whether this person has polypharmacy. Sometimes polypharmacy causes mobility limitation, and this can be reverted with, just with the help of medication review. Oh, Sometimes we have to see what's associated with the mobility limitation, could be osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, or the bone joint limitations, creating sarcopenia and pain. It's very important to see pain and consider pain management. Again, we have to assess physical environment to reduce the risk of falls, include force prevention interventions such as home adaptations, consider and provide a stiff device to aid mobility, and provide safe space for walking. So uh, the handbook and the app, they have, especially the handbook, they have care pathways for the six conditions uh, that are strongly associated with the care dependency or the age. The app will walk you through the skin and the assessment and the algorithm in the app will show the list of interventions associated with the test result. But the most important part is that the app doesn't have, or the handbook doesn't have only interventions on disease or conditions. We look also at the social and physical environments in which other people live and what their needs for social care and support. So we have a pathway for social care and support. And this pathway includes help, whether this person needs help, personal assistance, the help with the third person, whether they need someone come at home to help them to walk around, to use the toilet, to dress, to bath, to shower, whether this person need assistive technology, aids, adaptations, whether the caregiver need any sort of support. Also, we look at problems uh, with the place where the person lives, like is this person have any problems and concerns with their safety, with their accommodation, with they live, the cost of housing, and what can be done to respond to those concerns. Uh, is it home adaptation, alternative accommodation? This person need more support from social welfare or in being engaged in the community housing programs. We look at also problems with the financing and we will ask supplementary question about financing and also we have interventions that should be considered to address this need. The question of loneliness and uh, how we can enhance social connection of other people? How can we use community resource? What's the opportunity for other people has to contribute and their connectivity using communications technology? Social engagement, 
is all the person able to pursue leisure, interest, hobby, work, volunteering, support their family? And what can we do to decrease the barriers uh, for social engagement? There could be many that goes beyond uh, from lack of opportunities, from lack of transport, even the cost to be engaged. And we have a subjective assessment for risk of elder abuse based on observational information and response and suggested response to that. This is the example of the screening tool that I mentioned before with the six priority conditions I'm going to repeat. We look at cognitive decline, mobility limitation, malnutrition, vision, hearing, depression, and this because they are the three priority conditions strongly associated with care dependence in old age. If you act in these conditions, actually you will be able to prevent the number of people who become care dependent. I will make a quick demonstration of the ICOP app so you have an idea more or less how does it work. The interactive app guides health and social care workers step by step through the process of screening older people at risk of care dependence in the community, undertaking a person-centered assessment of older people's health and social care needs, and designing a personalized care plan. The app can also be used by governments and organizations to train health and social care workers to deliver personalized care. The app went live today on Google Play and in two weeks, they will be available also in iOS. So the app, as I said, we have three steps, screening, assessment, and designing a care plan. First step is screen of the people at risk of care dependence in the community. So you see how the share rise that is done is very easy in the app. And then you see also the test of malnutrition that actually these are two subjective questions and this question is strong indicators for safety. If it's someone uh, failing the screening, the person should be referred to primary health care facility to do the confirmation of the screening that actually is the assessment. The app has all the functional tests to assess all the domains uh, that I mentioned before. Functional, you see now a functional test of cognition. This is the result. After the result, they, we look at the associated conditions, malnutrition, polypharmacy, cardiovascular disease, and at the end, the app will lead you the critical step, the, the give the results of uh, uh, the client's incapacity and also the associated disease and the need for adaptation to physical environments. And the most important part is this one person-centered goal setting in which in this conversation with the other people, you identify with the other person and the caregiver, what's the goal of care? First, you have to find the good of care, and then you have to go through all the interventions, the app from the interventions that should be included in the care plan, and you have to agree with the other person whether these interventions can be implemented, whether the best place this intervention can be implemented. In this way, you have the conversation, the empowering conversation with the, with the person in front of you, and this is the transformal aspect of the person-centered and personalized plan. It should be a collaboration. It's not only a doctor giving a prescription and telling what you have to do. It's to understand who are you, what your values and preference, what the things that matter to you, what's your goal. Actually, your goal is to be able to drive again because your girlfriend lives away and you cannot drive because you are having problems with vision example or with hearing and how all these interventions can help you actually to improve your intrinsic capacity and your functional ability so you can be able to do the things again that are important for you. And the second is this agreement between the other person, the caregiver, which intervention should be in the care plan, what can be done, because many interventions can be done at home, many interventions can be done at trauma health care clinic, and there are some procedures and interventions that the other person doesn't see value and they have the right actually 
uh, to say, no, I, I, I'm, I'm not interested in the disintegration of humanity, et cetera. They have a say about their, their life. One important aspect of the app is actually you can download the Kaplan with the, the, with the, the class increase capacity, as you say, the condition and what to do. You can print and you can share. You can share this Kaplan with the other person, the caregiver, and all the other health professionals involved in the implementation of the Kaplan. Because usually a Kaplan is not implemented only by one person. It can be implemented by a doctor together with a nurse, involved maybe uh, a physiotherapist, involved sometimes a nutritionist, etc. This is the principle. It's a multidisciplinary team with the other person in the center. Where we are now, we now manage to develop the tools and launch the tools. That is, you imagine there is a lot of enthusiasm worldwide about implementing those tools, about implementing integrated care. Before even we launched the tools, these tools have been already translated to Spanish, to Thai, to Chinese, to Vietnamese. Uh, they can't just taking it and, uh, and adapting it and piloting it in their own initiative. WHO will pilot it formally in 10 countries and with a very defined methodology because this has to do with data analysis. Uh, this has to do with uh, the use of uh, digital data and also the monitoring of other people health. You can imagine the huge potential this strategy has in terms of collecting function data on increased capacities of other people and functional ability and monitoring longitudinally they, they across, across the different periods of their life. Uh, actually, health system and services doesn't collect data in this capacity, doesn't collect data in, in functional ability. The data collected by the app, we, will ha we, can, uh, we have interoperability, can be incorporated in health information system across the world. Uh, across the world. And for that, we have to develop, think about security of the data. We have to think about interoperability and the integration of different data sets. So we have a big challenge ahead, but this will never be able uh, to be accomplished without the help of so hundreds of people who are behind this work. This is a work of, uh, here in WHO, we are a very small team, it's particular the name, the number of people working in IPOP are not even tell you. That's why I say, without the help of so many experts around the world with the voluntary work and the organization life in the National Federation of Aging, we would not be able to have this big accomplished. So I'm thanking all these people who have been working with us in developing IPOP. We had 30 academic and research institutions across 15 countries. We have a WGO steering group across six regions and six areas of work, different departments in WGO. More than 50 aging experts from WGO clinical consortium have aging involvement, as well as the WGO collaborating center for free clinical research and geriatric training, WGO collaborating center for public health aspects of musculoskeletal health and aging, universal doctors, and also uh, the support from the government of Japan, Germany, and Kanagawa Prefecture. I thank you all of you who has been supporting us and made this dream this possible. This is my email and my Twitter account and also the website which you can download all the tools. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Islaini. Uh, that certainly has really set the scene for some robust discussions and questions. And, and from the IFA, it's really been a pleasure to work with you. And, and I know um, that you and your team really punch above your weight. Um, so it's incredible that it's an international community behind this now, so, which is very promising. Um, first and foremost, I just want to tell all the people online that the presentation will be available. Um, Anna Sankster, who's the project lead at IFA, will be sending the link out to all those that registered. The 
Ms. Laney, we have a couple of questions that I would like to um, share with you. And the first question comes from Margot, and it's really about does the iCOPE package enable healthcare professionals to identify the reason for functional decline? So she goes on to say, are infectious diseases and their related complications considered as triggers for functional decline? Mm -hmm. uh, what infection disease is, um, is not really the triggers of uh, functional decline. They can, they can trigger, yes. Uh, depending on your physiological reserve, you can recover from my infectious disease or not. So actually, I can, I can give an example of acute event that may actually impact your intrinsic capacity uh, in a more permanent way. And this, for example, could be a fall. And a fall in which you, you have a, a, rib, a rib fracture and you are forced to stay a long time in bed rest. I think infectious disease has a little bit the same effect. So some people recover from this, some other not. And this has to do with the, actually the physiological reserves that's part of intrinsic capacity. I would say the stronger determinant of intrinsic capacity is more the chronic disease. Uh, in the, for example, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, chronic osteoarthritis, that, that the disease that actually deplete uh, your physiological reserve for a longer time. And they're strongly associated with those impairments where I just mentioned the, the hypertension diabetes strongly associated with uh, cognitive decline. Uh, for example, you don't treat a diabetes, it can develop a ret retinopathy diabetic that is also associated with the vision impairment. And without those capacity, you lose your independence. If you cannot hear, you cannot see, or you cannot uh, move around. Okay, we've, we've got lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to give you a couple to begin with. Anna has said, how could dementia inclusive community initiatives complement the development of Age Friendly? And Neil has asked the question, does the screening tool differentiate between depression and apathy? Um, the, the, this is, I hope it's part of the AG Friendly City Initiative. The AG Friendly Initiative is a multi sectoral approach, is, is broader, that actually you look at uh, many sectors, transport sector, housing, educational sector, and health sector are part of AG Friendly Initiative. And what I hope to does is actually tell what's the role of the health sector to make societies uh, which everyone can age and to make connection between the health sector with all the sector, the social care sector, transport sector, et cetera. But as the main, main audience of uh, WHO is ministers of health, uh, this becoming more exciting for them if, than age friendly cities that uh, we talk with the mayors. But this is just an entry point. We, we entry points through the health sector with ICOP and then we spend more to a moment sector approach that is really more impactful for other people. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. Um, Go ahead. Let, let, me, let me just, uh, I'll loop back around to, to Neil's question in a minute, but Joanne from, I think it's Canada, has uh, said she's just curious as to the observation that this screening tool is like a simpler version of the interi that is used by care managers in, in Canada. Um, I like ICO, but wonder who the target audience is and what the expected follow-up is after the screening is done, which is, a, which is a great question. You've got the screening tool, but then what? Yeah. Well, uh, um, from uh, the internet, I think uh, what, yes, I ask, um, ICOP screen, we have a screening and we have a set of functional tests that should be done in a primary health care setting. Uh, I, I'm so happy to say it's, it's, it looks like inter because it looks everything. It looks like inter it looks like Rockwood model, they look like FRID uh, 5 component for pretty uh, diagnosed, the PID model. It looked like the geriatric assessment because we were inspired by them. We built on their work. And we just, this is just the knowledge of translation of years of work done by 
all the experts, geriatricians, gerontologists, etc. But it's a very, very simple question. Six questions, six minutes can be done by everyone. So this is the added value. We, we, we use and we translate it in something that is a public health approach. Um, and the, the other question I forgot. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the question was, what then? You know, after ah, the screening's yeah. done, what, what happens then? Yeah, remember, there is three steps. Screening, assessment, developing a personalized care plan. So the strategy is community health worker, nurse, or you use a mobile phone, you screen for people at risk of care dependence at home in the community. People who are screened positive, they are referred to a primary health care clinic. In the primary health care clinic, they should receive the person-centered assessment. Actually, you confirm uh, those conditions that are screening positive, that you confirm they really, you have a diagnosis. And then the result of this assessment will inform a personalized care plan that should be implemented by health professional. So th that's, that's the, the follow-up. Good. Um, from Neil, uh, does the screening tool differentiate between depression and apathy? Uh, no, the screen is just a screening. They just tell you whether you likely to have either subthreshold depression or depression. Yep. And then the assessment tool will confirm whether you have a depression or not. Uh, apathy or, or depressive mood or subthreshold depression, yes, the two differentiate, the assessment to differentiate between apathy or mood impairment, depressive mood from a full depression. Okay. Um, Moira uh, from Africa has said, it's wonderful the number of translations have been done. Have you had any input from sub-Saharan African countries in the development of these tools? Yes. We did a regional consultation last year in South Africa in which we had 60 countries from Africa, English speaking, French speaking, also Portuguese speaking. It was a big, big consultation where this was a draft and what we did, we took the draft and they, they actually, we walked them all the care pathways and also the feasibility of implementing this in Africa, etc. And we incorporate all the inputs and we revise the draft. Now in November this year, we're gonna go back to Africa and do another, uh, we'll be now induction training because now the tool is being finalized. And uh, Africa, this tool is translated in French also because the French speaking country in Africa. And when I designed this tool, I tell you, Africa was in my heart. I was just thinking about the community health programs, you know, and the communities in Africa, etc., and how this could be used for them. Wonderful. Um, we, jo Joanne has asked, she'd like to know the cost of the application and if it's available for individual caregivers who may want to use it. Um, yes, this is available for anyone. Um, this is a, there is a component on caregivers at the end, and the I think this uh, the caregiver the support of caregivers I think will be the next step of ICO. I think we need to develop a, a specific model on support for caregivers with also the help of digital technology etc. Uh, so this is the core the basic set. Uh, we talk about caregivers there, but I think we need to move more in terms of uh, caregiver support. Mm. Islani, as we wrap up this very important webinar and we move into 2020, which will be the 30th year to celebrate the International Day of Older Persons, what is your vision for ICOPE in 2020 going forward? Where do you see that it's going to, to be and, uh, and how will it change the landscape for older people? Um, I, I see various things unfolding. Uh, first of all, I see ICOP has been embraced and it is not even our child anymore. It, I, I, we lost control of ICOP. ICOP is out there. Everyone's taking, adapting, changing, implementing, translating, and, and going ahead. Um, what I, I try to do now in 2020 exactly is do a uh, pilot of ICOP standardized technology. Uh, we want to understand 
uh, whether this using a digital app really increase the efficiency of and the quality of the care delivery, uh, had a better impact on health outcomes, can make the program uh, cheaper because we save money on training, etc. And whether the other people, they feel any benefit on this. Uh, there is also the high tech way of thinking because now we are thinking about uh, predictive models on data integration, data analytic interoperability. So this is a wide different world. And uh, when we enter into using innovation, digital health technology, we had no idea where we are going into. And now we have to deal with all this complexity and develop research and guidance to member states on this area as well. I hope we can do the knowledge translation right and come with guidance that can be very simple for member states incorporating the lesson learning. And this is what's going to happen uh, in 2020. So, Islaini, one last question, and it really comes from the place that IFA wants to be. How do we enable ICOPE to go forward? What is it that civil society can be doing to support this important endeavour going forward? I think, uh, Jane, um, uh, you, organisations like yours uh, have been ab absolutely fundamental in supporting uh, the Asian agenda, the Asian health, health aging worldwide. Uh, showing how this is important, what government should be paying attention for that, and if, including advocating within WGO itself uh, to um, make more investment and put my more attention on this. So you have been also big support in, in linking us uh, with the important network uh, that you should be aware and should be included in the development such type of tools. And uh, the next, uh, in, in disseminating it, I think this uh, webinar, has been, webinar has been a wonderful opportunity for so many people who want to learn about it and couldn't have access because they are not in Geneva, they are not in countries where you're gonna do the induction training, etc. Uh, one thing that I want to create is a network of volunteers for ICO and, and actually to help us in the training of ICO. Uh, because we go, I go everywhere worldwide and the requests are increasing. Kant are asking, could you come here and help us to introduce ICOP and here, here, here? And simply we cannot cope with the demand. So my idea is to create a network of volunteers who want to be trained as ICOP trainers and can help us to uh, disseminate and train more people around the world. Of course, WHO will pay their tickets and they will be the beautiful opportunity to travel around the world, uh, knowing different countries, different health systems, and work with WHO in the implementation of ICO. So this is one concrete idea, how we could work together as well. Well, look, thank you very much. And as just uh, a plug for IFA going forward, we hope, is Lainey, that you and ICO will be at IFA's 15th Global Conference in Niagara Falls in November in 2020. And we're certainly ready to step up and, and be part of or help create this network of, of uh, those, the ICO trainers. So thank you once again for your time and also your expertise, but most of all your leadership in uh, putting this on the agenda today. And, uh, and we very much hope that it's going to be part of the changing landscape of older people going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I cannot wait to be there in 2020 in, in, in the next IFA meeting. All right. Congratulations.